Hi everyone, Stepan here. In today's middle game video I'm going to talk about a subject that I don't think is covered enough in chess literature and uh, I've been trying to improve myself in that area for a while now and I find that considering this uh, during my games has, has helped me uh, improve somewhat and that's anticipating the end game during the middle game or in better words uh, thinking of your position and whether it would be good if the pieces get traded off. Now, most people uh, who are weak players, such as myself, uh, don't really have the mental capacity to consider anything else but the current position and their next move. But thinking ahead and thinking prophylactically in terms of an endgame during the middle game can make a huge difference. Uh, obviously, there are even openings during which you can anticipate the endgame. We are going to talk about that briefly as well. But in the middle game, uh, the fact uh, of uh, the end game being good or bad for you can be crucial uh, for you to win or to lose or, or to draw. And knowing when the situation is favorable uh, can be critical. We are going to look at three game examples. Uh, but first, uh, I'm going to talk about the common principles of what should be good in, good in the end game and how to recognize it during the middle game. Uh, first, let me just mention one opening. Uh, the Berlin endgame, uh, if you are familiar with that, so e4, e5, knight f3, knight to c6, the royal of Pez, uh, the Berlin with knight to f6, and now the most common continuation leading to the endgame with castles, knight takes e4, uh, d4, knight to d6, takes, 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 knight to f5, queen takes queen, king takes queen. Uh, this is a very heavily analyzed position, you can find the video on that on my channel, but the point is that this opening uh, is good for black because of the middle game and it's good for, for white because of the end game. Uh, obviously for the moment black has the bishop pair, uh, has the weakness on uh, e5 to exploit the overextended e pawn, but for white the end game is basically winning because uh, black's pawn majority on the queen side is imaginary. He has a 4 to 3 but doubled c pawns which are really hard to, to push through and all, it's almost impossible to create a passed pawn. On the other hand, white has a clear uh, kingside pawn majority 4 to 3 and if the pieces get traded off, white has incredibly high chances of creating a passed pawn on the king, uh, king side, which can often be winning. So the Berlin endgame is uh, an example of uh, a winning endgame, which you can spot during the opening. So the most strategies for white in the Berlin revolve around pushing his kingside pawn majority and trading off the pieces, while on the other hand, black wants to do the opposite, keep the pieces on the board and prevent the kingside pawn majority of, uh, from white to move. So this is something we know because it's chess theory. If you could apply this principle to every middle game you, you play, and if you were able to assess whether uh, you have white chances in the end game, uh, like in this position, or, or whether you're on the black side and you would lose the end game, can mean a huge difference. And basically, if you know that you have a Berlin end game for white, you want to trade the pieces off, you want to enter the end game, and if you think you have the black position, then you don't. And often uh, people neglect to think that way. I would like to encourage you to consider every single one of your middle game positions. Uh, in these in this respect and just try to think of playing an end game just picture the pieces uh, being off the board so uh, the first example i chose just to illustrate that is completely absurd uh, let's imagine a rook on f1 a rook on f8 a rook on a8 and a rook on a1 let's imagine a, a, a knight on f3 a knight on e6 a knight on c6 and the bishop let's say here uh, white wants to trade the pieces off. That's very clear. If there are no pieces on the board, everybody can see that this position is winning for white. It's never going to be this direct and it's never going to be this obvious, but if you can spot one weakness, which might be enough to convert an endgame, then you know what your strategy is. You want to trade the pieces off. So this example is clear. Doubled pawns mean weaknesses in endgames, isolated pawns mean weaknesses in endgames, and usually if you follow the principle, the principle of two weaknesses, it's considered that two weaknesses are enough to win a game, then if you can spot two weaknesses in your opponent's position, which are still there after you trade the pieces off, that means that it's good to, to, to enter the endgame and trade off the pieces. Our next example is slightly uh, more complex, and this is actually very possible during a real game. Uh, here it's wise to play, and uh, 
if there are no pieces of the board, believe it or not, the, the position is completely winning for white. The reason for that is we are going to see in the first game example, the game between Magnus Carlsen and Boris Gelfand, is the queenside pawn majority. White has a 3-2 pawn majority on the queen side. Black has a 4-3 pawn majority on the king side. And even if you put uh, the doubled f pawn, let's say, on e6 or on e7, this would still be better for white for a simple reason that the black king is farther away from the from the queen side than the white king is farther is is away from on the king side that means that white is going to have an easier time stopping black's pawn majority and black is going to have a harder time stopping white's pawn majority so put some pieces on the board uh, imagine some pieces on the board and if you have positions like these where you have a queen side pawn majority try to take them off in your head and try to find the win. Uh, you might not be completely correct, but very often if you have a pawn majority, which can easily be utilized, then an endgame is going to be much better for you than for your opponent. Uh, the next example uh, is what we are going to see in the third uh, third game, Paul Benko, Viktor Korchnoi, uh, when knights outplay bishops in endgames. Uh, in this position, once again, this is another random position I've set up on the board. Once again, white is completely winning and they don't have to turn on the engine to know that. White is com completely winning because black's, bishops, black's bishop is a dead piece. Uh, black's bishop has no targets. Once white plays h3, what does the bishop attack? At the same time, uh, the, the white king has a lot of square, squares to enter the position. The black king is going to have to create some pawn weaknesses in order to infiltrate the position, and the knight has a free time just hopping all around the board and attacking the weaknesses in black's position. In this case, uh, neither side has a pawn majority, neither side has a pawn weakness, the structures are ideal, but okay, I'm going to turn on the engine now. Uh, white to play, the position is plus one and a half. It's pretty clear that if white manages to create a weakness, then white is going to be winning. So put some more pieces on the board in your head, put some rooks on the d-file, uh, I don't know, put another bishop or another knight there, and white is going to have a winning strategy in his head. If I stay, if my knight stays on the board and black is left with the bishop, I'm going to be winning. If you can, if you have this position on the board with uh, another pair of bishops and uh, both sides having two rooks, then if you think correctly and logically, then you are going to say, hmm, if I trade off my bishop and both rooks, I'm going to be winning. It's obviously hard to do that during a real game, but looking at game examples where players have done that and thinking in such way is going to help you do that more often. Uh, another example I've set up, uh, this is coming back to the to the queenside pawn majority and slightly tapping into piece quality, which we are going to see in the second example. Uh, it's white to play and white wins. Uh, it's not a tactic like white to play and win, but if white uh, chooses the correct continuation, white has a much better game. Uh, of course, you can see that white has a 3-2 to two pawn majority on the queen side, and we said that uh, it's going to be easier to queen than black's 4-3 to three on the king side, because the king is farther away, and white has a slightly better uh, bishop. Let's say that this pawn is here. I've set this, this up. I didn't mean to hang a pawn. Let's say the pawn is on a6, so that white can't just take the pawn. But in this position, if white exchanges everything, takes takes uh, this position is better for white it's simply better for white okay uh, let me turn on the engine I mean it's a silly position because I've set it up but yeah okay the, cor the correct move is to take the rook the engine doesn't even take the loose pawn so you are often going to have positions like these in middle games this is the late middle game and you have to recognize when it's good to trade off the pieces and when it's not okay uh, the three game examples uh, the first one is Magnus Carlsen versus Bo Boris Genf Gelfand in the 2013 candidates, uh, leading to Magnus, of course, winning the World Championship. And this was the Rosolimo Nezmedin of Sicilian, which uh, resulted in a queenside pawn majority for Magnus. So let's see what happened. I'm going to take you through, this is now move 7, uh, we are going to look at uh, about 20 moves, uh, just so that you can see how powerful the majority was. So here Magnus continued with d4, knight f6, bishop to e3, and the pawns got exchange, exchanged. c takes d4, knight takes d4. Now, uh, 
white has a 3 to 2, that much is clear, black has a 4 to 3. So if you apply the principles that we just talked about, and by the way, this is late opening, not even the, the proper middle game yet, Magnus surely must have factored in that he's going to have a much easier time creating a passed pawn, and he played accordingly. So let's see what happened. Bishop d7, c4, when you have a pawn majority, you have to push it forward, otherwise it's not a strength. Uh, Every chess strength which you can find in books is a theoretical strength. If you don't use it, then it's meaningless. So if you have a pawn majority and your pawns are on a2, b2 and c2, it's irrelevant. It doesn't mean anything. Uh, Gelfand continued with knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, bishop c6, trying to safeguard the queen side and putting the bishop on the strongest diagonal, knight c3 developing, bishop e7, a3, preparing to push forward and Magnus hasn't finished his develop development yet, the queen is uh, yet to be, de to be developed, but he recognizes that the threat of the pawn majority pushing forward is probably going to put Gelfand off his game. So now a5, uh, which is the correct move, but still uh, b5 is going to play it, for the moment it's defended by the bishop, but as you can see, it's move 14, and Boris Gelfand, a really strong player, is already struggling to keep Magnus' pawn majority from moving forward. Queen d3 castles, rook a d1, not going for rook b1 just yet, trying to uh, centralize his pieces first, queen c7, bishop e5, uh, queen b6, queen to g3, rook fd8, and now uh, if you pause the video and think about the position and think about everything that we just said, uh, should white be exchanging the rooks or not. By the way, uh, queen takes b2 is never a threat because of knight d5 winning the bishop, uh, because the bishop is attacking the queen, so the queen can never take the b2 pawn. Uh, so now, should white exchange the rooks or not? Yes, he should, because any endgame is better for him, and, and as you can see, the pawns are already advanced, whereas black's pawn majority uh, is harder to queen and it's still stuck on the second rank. So rook takes d8, queen takes d8, rook to d1. Queen b6, bishop d4. Uh, queen to b3, rook to d3. Still, queen b2 is not a possibility because of knight here. So queen c2 was played. We have b4. And this is slightly technical, but a b4, a b4. Uh, bishop takes b4 cannot be played because bishop f6 hanging the knight. So the bishop is currently stuck defending the knight. So he, he caught the, the, the correct moment to play b4. Knight h5 was played, seemingly like uh, attacking the queen and enabling black to play uh, bishop takes b4, but now queen e5, uh, threatening the knight, threatening checkmate, bishop f6, and now a tactical exchange because the c3 knight is hanging in the end, which of course favors Magnus, queen takes h5, bishop takes d4, rook takes d4, queen takes c3, queen to a5, defending uh, the, the b4 pawn tactically, if rook takes queen, uh, rook checkmate, so it can't be taken, rook f8, defending, queen to b6, defending both the rook and the pawn, and now it's clear that this 2 to 1 on the queen side is going to be overwhelming, Magnus went on to win in a couple of moves, so let's come back to, to the original position, uh, after d4, Knight f6, bishop e3, c takes d4, knight takes d4, bishop d7, uh, c4 was the first move, and Magnus never declined a peace trade ever since he got this pawn majority, and he managed to utilize it. Of course, Boris Gelfand is a very strong player, so it took some tactics and some extraordinary play, but he basically played for his one advantage, his queenside pawn majority. Okay, uh, so remember that if you have a pawn majority, an endgame is good for you. Uh, the next example is just uh, remarkable, this is one of my favorite games Anatoly Karpov ever played, even though it's not that famous. Uh, this is from 1992, played in Beal, uh, and this uh, conversion into the endgame is a combination of two advantages. One of them is the space advantage that Anatoly Karpov obviously has on the queen side, and the other one is peace quality. Now let's talk about both. Firstly, uh, a space advantage because the pawns are further advanced and white is controlling uh, the squares on black's uh, fourth rank, so white has a space advantage on the queen side. And when it comes to piece quality, the g7 bishop and the h7 knight are very bad pieces. So they're not doing anything to help on the queen side, and they're uh, a long time uh, away from helping. They, it would take them several moves. 
Okay, so when you combine all of these factors, what should Anatoly Karpov play here? Firstly, he sees that he has a strong uh, space advantage and uh, and the piece placement advantage, and space advantage is best emphasized by minor pieces. Rooks don't really have a say in the space advantage, rooks control open files. So would the rook exchange favor Anatoly Karpov? Yes. So he highlights the quality of his minor pieces by the absence of every good piece black has on the board. If you remove the rook, if you remove the queen, white is going to have superior pieces. So rook d1. Rook takes d1, queen takes d1, bishop g4, uh, pinning the knight to the queen, queen to d6, going for an exchange, and black doesn't really have much choice. If he puts his queen to a passive square like b7, then uh, e5 is hanging, and everything is hanging, so he has to take. Queen takes d6, knight takes d6. Now look at the piece quality. If black captures on f3, that's irrelevant for the position. Uh, the space advantage and the two uh, much better bishops give white an almost winning edge. Now let's see how uh, Anatoly Karpov utilized that. Firstly, you should have noticed the rook exchange and the queen exchange. In this position, uh, after knight to h7, it's still not clear that white is winning because the queen and the rook are good pieces. But after knight takes d6, everybody can see that white is winning here. So the game continued king to f8, trying to march the king to the sensitive queen side, which is about to get slaughtered. a5 pushing his uh, advanced pawns even further, king e7, knight c4, the knight was attacked, uh, bishop takes f3, g takes f3, irrelevant as I said, uh, it doesn't really matter that much, the knight had no good squares anyway, d4 was taken, b5, knight to a3, and now a6 was played. And here uh, is a pattern that, uh, well, it's really hard to to use in your own games, but looking at masterpieces like this one uh, of Anatoly Karpov really does help a lot. And you should always consider sacrifices in the middle game if you have a strong pawn chain or a strong passed pawn or the ability to create a passed pawn. So in this position, uh, this is now almost an end game already after Anatoly Karpov traded everything off. He found a remarkable, remarkable move using the fact that these two pieces can definitely uh, not help on the queen side. The king is still too far away and the knight is going to take several squares to get anywhere close. So the knight, uh, the knight moved and the knight took on b5. So knight takes b5. It's really strange sacrificing two pieces. But after c takes b5, bishop takes b5, the bishop cannot be taken. If you take a b5, then a6 is an unstoppable queening threat. Uh, knight to e6 seems to be uh, making it to the defense, but not really because of the move bishop b6, preventing the knight from getting into c7. Now king d7 is the only hope, at least getting the bishop a7, king c6, a8, queen, King takes b6, and after queen a5, white has a queen for three pieces, but he is about to win b5. The bishop on g7 and the knight on h7 are still dead pieces, and white is completely winning. So after bishop takes b5, you cannot take the bishop, so knight g5, uh, attacking the f3 pawn. Uh, bishop takes a6, of course, doesn't really matter about f3, and this pawn majority is going to be winning. So it's a piece for three pawns, but... Such good three pawns. He has three connected passed pawns and the position is remarkable. Now let's get back to the original position. After knight h7, uh, can you picture the position with bishop takes a6? That's, that's the question. Knight h7 and the position with bishop takes a6. Because I'm sure that Anatoly Karpov had that in mind. It's not always sure that it's going to, be, to work, but if you see your trumps in the position, if you know your advantages and you play for them, sometimes it might just be too hard for your opponent to stop them. And it's not as if you're winning pieces or pawns, you're just trading off a rook and the queen. And by trading off those pieces, uh, Anatoly Karpov gave himself a much better middle game and a much better endgame transposition. So you highlight your own strengths by trading off the pieces, but it's important to know when to do it. Okay, uh, the third game example uh, is another, this is a remarkable game, once again, uh, one of my favorites, and this is a great practice in playing with the bad bishop versus the knight. I've tried to save the position for Korchnoi several times, but I couldn't. So in this position, Palobenko has, uh, has the white pieces. So let's see what happened. Uh, bishop 
to b5 was played last knight to d4 attacking the bishop knight c4 check which is a mistake by Korchnoi because uh, this now allows Paul Benko to simply take bishop takes c4 bishop takes c4 bishop c uh, rook to c2 uh, why rook to c2 uh, there are two open files c file d file he wants to double up on the c file and trade off the pieces why does he want to trade off the pieces let's get back to to the, to the example i put on the board here you have a good knight versus bad bishop the bishop has no targets the knight is just dominating the board this is why in this position paul benko understood that trading of the rooks is going to win him uh, the game because the bishop is going to be far inferior to the knight so bishop a6 was played rook h to c1 and you don't really have time to decline a trade you you, you basically have to take if you play rook to d8 then rook to c2 and you're going to be losing for different reasons so he has to take rook c2 rook c2 king d7 e5 grabbing space and putting the the pawns on the opposite side of the bishop and now does this bishop have any targets no this was a waiting move but also a useful move with the move e5 you just killed off the bishop the only piece on light square is the c2 rook which is about to get exchanged off there are no better moves for korchnoi but rook to c8 allowing the trade rook takes c8 king takes c8 and now this is move 24 the game lasted for 57 more moves i'm not going to go through the entire game but i'm just going to tell you that the position is from a human perspective winning from an engine perspective let's see the, the evaluation it's plus one which is well it's almost winning the engines think it's almost winning but for humans it's really hard to play so what did paul benko do he recognized his strengths uh, Korchnoi made a mistake trading off his knight for the bishop and then all Paul Benko had to do was trade off the pair of rooks which was really hard to stop and now he has a winning position it's not easily winning and it took him 60 moves but he won let's see what happened I'm just going to browse through the moves quickly just to see that it's not an easy win and uh, that even though the bishop is hopeless it takes a lot of maneuvering to accomplish that so obviously you don't want to trade if you trade off your knight for the bishop nothing is going to come out of that and black doesn't have a move black cannot play the only piece uh, black can move that makes some sense is the king but the king has a really hard time infiltrating the position and the bishop is a spectator it's as if you can move your pawn around the board without being able to attack anything knight c4 slowly but surely defending all the weaknesses and infiltrating the position slowly slowly maneuvering taking his time it's important not to rush in end games like these and after a while he managed to finally break through took one pawn took here and now this is just winning uh, he's queening at the same time but he's going to have two extra pawns so this position is just lost and coming back to the original position on move let's say here king on e3 let's trade off these pieces so this was the crucial mistake knight c4 was the mistake after this i mean if i had this on the board i would know what to do i might not be able to convert as well as paul benko did but i would know what to do so when you have a position like this when you can sense that you are going to have a good knight versus bad bishop which by the way uh, often happens in the sicilian defense trade off everything else and play for your strengths this uh, i hope that this video will help you understand what your strengths are in the middle game and help you emphasize them and very often if you anticipate the end game correctly uh, realizing what your strengths are is going to involve uh, trading off into an end game okay uh, please let me know what you think uh, i hope i managed to explain this well enough once again uh, thank you very much for the kind comments and the support uh, let me know what you think about the video and stay tuned for more chess see you later bye bye